Welcome to X-Men Evolution, episode 14 of Cyclops is Waiting for Me, an X-Men animated recap podcast. I'm JC, and even though we are in the second season of X-Men Evolution, I still flub the intro on it. I got so used after 70 episodes of the original intro. And I'm Rod. We'll probably get used to this intro just in time for 97 to finally come out. You know, I, I keep posting about it on our Instagram, and this is probably about three weeks after the post, but did you see the Funko Pop of Cyclops, specifically for X-Men 97, is like on sale now. It's it's unreal to me how many X-Men 97 things are coming out right now. There's no way in my mind that it is not a delay at this point from, it was supposed to be out probably right before Loki is my bet. Yeah, or maybe maybe right after now, or I guess we'll see. Well, because we're not even at the time of recording. Loki's not even out. Yeah. So that would mean it would be like a November-ish release. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like we, we got pushed way past where we were supposed to at this point. My gut tells me that the studios are probably just like, especially streaming studios are like, we have we to- We gotta milk this shit. Yeah, so yeah. I-, I I'm willing to bet because they just now released the Loki release date, you know? And so I'm willing to bet that they're going to hold off until like, okay, are, does it look like people are going to stay subscribed? And if they're not, because they're like not even waiting for Ahsoka and Loki. Please stay. Please stay. We have another AAA thing coming. To be fair, I, I'm I'm not as confident on the Venn diagram of Ahsoka and Loki, so. Right. Well, I, I, I wonder if they're just counting on like households, you know? Like yeah, someone... it's got to be. Like there's one person who's yeah. the Star Wars person, one person who's the Marvel person, yeah. one person who's under the age of six, so they watch all the kids' content. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, just drip feed enough of it. Yeah, because usually there was, you know, like a couple weeks at least between big things and there, it feels like now there's not even waiting. So, yeah, we'll see. I know they won't do this because of how like programming usually, well, you know, I was going to say how programming usually works. We're not in a usually era right now. Yeah, uh, usually doesn't exist anymore. I think at the time that this releases, if WGA is still on strike, which they might not be because they're actually going back to negotiations last I heard. Let's see how well that phrase ages. Right, yeah. <laughs> Leave in the comments how that went, future all of us. If the strike is still going on when this episode is released, I read that this will be the longest WGA strike like in history, which is insane. So that's fun. Anyway, well, I was going to say was, I, I think it'd be fun as a fan to have a, a series like X-Men 97 come out during like the holidays. So you just like kind of chill and watch. I know they don't want to do that because like rating. Rod, do you really want to have to remotely record this while I'm on the East Coast with, <laughs> without my good audio devices? Because that's what you're asking for, Rod. I'm not asking for that. I'm just as a fan. I just want to watch that. Also, thanks to friends at Adobe, we now have access to the cleanup tool. So I might be playing with that when we don't have anything urgent. So if like we have like a, a gap or something, I might still... I might mess around with that, but I know that nothing is ever an easy learning curve. So it sounds easy. AI is not easy. It does a bunch of stuff that you're not used to. So who knows? But anyway, if we do get into some like really, you know, you have kids in the background yelling or something. Might be oh, no, I'm, something. I'm just talking about literally having a work <laughs> laptop and that's oh, it. Gotcha. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Cyclops is waiting for me is our weekly podcast series where we're going back and watching every single X-Men animated episode we can find along with some bonus episodes. Our first series started with the original 1992 X-Men animated series building up to the release of X-Men 97 which we thought was coming to Disney Plus in 2023, where we went through all that. Anyway, so we're watching some other shows. Evolution, we're on season two now, so obviously it's been a little while. Some quick reminders. We're a recap show about a series that started over 20 years ago. There are going to be spoilers. And if you look up character names on fandom wikis, you're going to have shit spoiled for you, whether or not you wanted to. If you don't want it spoiled for you, avoid the wikis, pause this podcast, go watch the episode, and then come back. Also, just a quick heads up, Next week, if you go in the order of Disney Plus, it is episode two. If you go in the order of any of the wikis, they're saying that's episode three. We have a special guest likely coming. We haven't recorded with them yet, so I don't want to promise anything <laughs> until they have actually recorded with us. But yeah, that's just an FYI because there is no previously on making of an animated series like what we had for X Men 92. I don't have a confirmed episode number because we're seeing it in different spots. Oh no. Dis Disney and IMDB that. are one way. Everything else is another way because of the order they aired. And we'll get into the order they aired in just a second. Okay. Also, we're not sponsored or affiliated with Marvel, <laughs> Marvel Animation, Saban, Disney, Disney Plus. I can name a lot of stuff that we are not sponsored Wait, is, by. Is Saban involved with this now? I just felt like okay. dropping Saban. <laughs> the, only purely from the amount of shit we have talked about Saban's production schedule, yeah. I just felt like throwing them in there. Yeah, yeah. 
I was like, oh no, he's a, he, he, he has it. Every time I find out something is, is going wrong in town, he's usually involved, or his name, or his company, or something. Anyway, don't forget to follow us on social media at Cyclops IWFM Pod on Instagram, TikTok, Threads, X, and Facebook. And of course, make sure to follow us on your favorite podcast services. Now, on to the show. Today, we're going to be talking about season two, episode one, titled Growing Pains. It aired on September 29th of 2001. Currently sits at a 7.0 star rating on IMDb, and that's actually the first bit of trivia. This was originally set to air two weeks prior. I was going to say, is this the first one since 9-11? Yes, it was actually supposed to air on September 15th, and for those of us who are old enough to, to remember that era, it was about a week before regular television started airing regularly. There was It was mostly that 24 hour news cycle on basically everything. And if you did have programming, it was most likely reruns because you know the, the country was in a very weird state at that point. I remember specifically, so I was in college and we had Same. a few channels. So, and also because I was in school for music, a lot of us watch music stuff. And this was, I know there's the joke, like when MTV still played music, they still played music at this time. Yeah. And MTV just went off air. It was just like a screen, you know, with the, we're not doing shit right now. And especially yeah. Because they were in New York, you know, like TRL, all the biggest stuff was happening there. They did. It was kind of just like the sign of respect. Like we're not going to yeah. have entertainment while people are dealing with this. And so I specifically remember, actually, I should do a video about this on my TikTok. The very, when they went back live, the very first thing they had was Jewel live perform hands. You know, like my hands are small. Like, yeah. It's like it's a very like respectful way to come back on air. I'm actually kind of surprised a show like this came. Well, I guess that's not too soon. It's, a, it's the end of the month and stuff. It's hard to say like what's too soon. Like there's no precedent for any of this. <laughs> yeah. And and I, I think it's also one of those scenarios where it's like, you know, other people had already started to do programming that was entertainment and stuff like that. So you could only hold for so long and, you know. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to sound callous uh, about it by any means, but it's also like you said, there's not a playbook for that kind of stuff because yeah. hopefully you don't ever have to open that playbook again. Yeah. And I think the, the, the one that gives me a little bit of pause about this is there was, I remember specifically they were holding a lot of stuff that was like action or like violence based. Yeah. Just because of sensitivity of stuff. And now watching this, I'm actually curious and you may, you may have like found some stuff on this. I'm actually curious if stuff got changed in yep. that time because three, another one three scenes which we'll get to oh, yeah. as they start to occur that were removed and they were actually on the international releases of the episodes and there was a dvd called mutants rising that okay. those scenes were actually included in the dvd oh interesting so they okay. they did not make it to the edit that was on disney plus which is what rod and i watched when we're going through this but yeah there were three shots that were removed from the episode according to the evolution fandom wiki Okay, well, that, that doesn't surprise me, even if they didn't have anything specific to do with that. Some people might know this. I don't know if you're not old enough to remember, but one of the biggest thing that got delayed was the Spider-Man movie. Yeah, I mean, the big look... Scene of the Twin Towers. If you, if you go on YouTube and look up the original trailer from it, it was a helicopter that he yeah. saved by putting a giant web between the two towers. There was a handful of projects that, like, the timing was just weird like, how on the nose stuff was. And, like, that, like, Spider-Man was, like, one of them, like, what? I want to say an early version of Lilo and Stitch... Mm -hmm. When the spaceship that is shaped like a plane was flying through, they actually changed the animation that it was going yeah. through mountainous area as opposed to through like one of the cities of the island. That too, yeah, yeah, so much stuff. What a, yeah, and there was a, there was another. I want to say it was like a Johnny Knoxville movie, or there was some. It was definitely like an action comedy thing mm -hmm. where a plane was like approaching a city area, and it was like. Yeah, you have to hold this thing for like two years, or you know, you're there's no way to there's no way to release this in good conscience right now. But like we we're saying, on to the show. So things kick off. Oh God, I started with a pun, ah, and I fucking fun. fuck you, Rod. I'm so mad that I did a I did a pun. I don't like uh. puns. I don't do <laughs> puns intentionally. So the episode That's starts good. off, and we're seeing a girls' soccer game, Bayville versus another school. It is four four with eleven seconds left, and we find out that Jean is the 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 star striker of the team, and. I'm trying to think back, aside from in the comics, which there's just this tradition of the X-Men love to play softball and baseball together. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that ever being a thing for Jean, is, is her being a star athlete kind of scenario. 
Yeah, I guess all these kids are probably in. It makes sense for them to be in athletics at this school because it's kind of more of an excuse for them to train as opposed to like, oh, all these kids are in boot camp for no reason. Yeah, and then you you know when in the comics they're all in the Xavier Institute, they're not exactly like having intramural programs right. with other like human schools. This is this is that alternate version of the Marvel Universe where they're actually in a public school. Like they are actually made to interact with other kids here. So I do appreciate the really clean parallel between season openers. How the last season started off with like boys American football. Right. And Duncan, and then season two starts off with girls, rest of the world football, and Duncan. <laughs> so Gene ends up scoring a goal in the final second, wins the match, and that was we find out the semifinals. It was interesting to me that the semifinals was during like the first week of a new semester, right. but okay. Yeah, I don't know when soccer seasons happen in the States, so sure. Yeah, so I kind of interpret it as it needed to be like January or so, mm. because they specify that it's another semester. So I don't know. I didn't get any indication that we were seeing like the next school year yeah, yeah. as much as like the halfway point, because they specified semester, not school year. So okay, I got gotcha. you. I could be totally wrong on that, but that was just how I read the scenario. So sees Gene, he starts to approach, and then Duncan looked a little different. Like Duncan looked like in the maybe the winter or summer break, whichever it actually is, that he beefed up a little bit. Like he, he didn't look as tough in the last season as he did here, right? Yeah, and he also had like more of an asshole vibe going on for him. <laughs> yeah, he definitely got broier when he was probably taking steroids to recover from that concussion from season one. Oh, there you go. Actually, there you go. His, his concussions like changed his personality, or he was like, "Man, I gotta get stronger so I don't keep getting these uh, accidents." Yeah, I gotta stop falling over. You get that cutoff moment with Duncan. Scott yells over to Gene, "Are you riding? Or are you walking?" Which what an asshole thing for Scott to say. He's becoming our Scott. He's our Scott. That was a hundred. <laughs> 100% my vibe on this episode is he is full-fledged our Scott. Turns out the Scott we know is because of hormones. The Scott we know is the 17-year-old <laughs> Scott. Yeah. 16-year-old <laughs> Scott hadn't gone full asshole yet. But to the writer's credit, that sounds like something like a 17-year-old athletic boy in high school would say to try to, you know, win over a girl's like, are you riding or you're walking? Yeah. Uh, okay, fuck you, man. So Gene is like, oh, yeah, Duncan's going to drive me home. And then the only part that I don't think Gene would have reacted as positively to as she did, he's like, yeah, maybe we'll get lost along the way. I feel like Gene, because I know she's a telepath, but I feel like she also has a little bit of like empath in her. I feel like she would be like, oh, don't use me as a part of this, like, you know, dude pissing contest kind of thing. Yeah, that was it. it there was nobody like very likable in this scene. No, no, <laughs> nobody was really lovable. Maybe, maybe the girl who passed maybe. the ball to Jean, she's yeah. the best person in the scene. Yeah. And then Scott has like this really shitty retort where it's like, yeah, well, I guess with you, that's expected. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so are you saying he's dumb and he gets lost or that he's like good at stealing your girl? Because either yeah. one, not that great, dude. Yeah. Oh, cuts over. They're in traffic where it's Scott driving, Kitty and Nightcrawler. And Kitty is making fun of the music. And this is one of the perfect times for this joke to happen where she says that whatever the band is, is so last millennium. Yeah. And that's literally a year prior. So it yeah. is the most like myopic teenage view of like, oh, this is old because it's from last year. And people are still like that because some people know, but I have a TikTok account where, <laughs> you know, it goes frequently viral talking about 90s and 2000s music. And people are so, not everybody, there's like 25% mostly Gen Xers, so anal about what is considered 2000s and 90s music. I'm like, listen, man, Britney Spears span decades. So if a song came out like January 1st of 2000, I'm going to chalk that up to 90s and you can think it's 2000. That's fine. She seems like one of those people. Yeah. To, the to date the episode, there's a meme that's going around right now where it's if NSYNC announces a reunion tour yeah. and your birth date doesn't start with 19, you need to back the fuck up. Yeah, because we need time and ibuprofen to get the tickets yeah we're, I, we we can't do all-nighters to to be there for it I, I didn't think that they were actually gonna do a tour and they as of recording this they haven't announced it but now i'm kind of curious because they went from like presenting at the vmas to they just filmed the hot ones so well this is gonna age well rod because right. this this will definitely be solved by the time the episode yeah. airs 
So that is wild. So the band they're listening to, she calls it the Stone Cyphers, which if you Google that, so that, I knew that's not a real band. So I Googled it just to see if it would pull up this episode. It does not like what we episode. did with Dracula the musical. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't pull up this episode. Somebody on this writing team is a conspiracy theorist. So that's cool. But it is a cool band. That does sound like a band. Wait, so would... what is Stone Cyphers? You can't drop a thing like that without saying it. There's a book called like The Stone, The Cipher, and The Shadow, which I didn't read the description on it, but it. It attributed it to something, some like dark thing or whatever. And then a stone cipher is a type of like encryption thing or whatever, like a right. type of cipher or whatever. And once guy didn't read too much into it. I love but, how you like started to research and you're like, I'm good. Yeah, no, I'm good. You, oh, yours because, was, it's not a real band, so I have stopped caring. Yeah. And also on an extra level of like, I'm good with this. You know, like in, in normal Google, it just kind of just messes up all your search results and stuff when you search something weird like that i'm on this beta program of the google ai thing so it is like actively learning from me so it just starts suggesting a bunch of other like conspiracy related and cipher related stuff like on the sidebar and like all this stuff and even when i'm typing my google docs i'm typing these notes it's like you looked up ciphers here's some more i was like this is not what i want okay so so now when rod researches the show he literally has to pull up an incognito window right. to do so <laughs> i'm not even sure if that works because everything is connected they know everything everything that's amazing um, but we'll we'll get you a tour browser that's right. all so get you on a, an fbi <laughs> list right so the but there was definitely a distinctive like at least half a song someone wrote like by like a kind of a 90s all rock band or you know i get 2000 whatever it doesn't matter and i i don't recognize the song and uh, the only thing I could find was the composer for the series is named William Anderson. Not a great name, not a searchable name. <laughs> Don't talk shit about the guy's name. Just say it wasn't very searchable. There is a difference. Well, I, I'm going to give him more flack here, though, because then he had, a, he had a link to his official website as a composer. It is not paid for it. So I hope you're doing okay. I did. I was able. You're to find, such a judgy fuck, Rob. I was able to find more information about him. His name is William Kevin Anderson. I looked. Now you're going to dox him, right? He's done a bunch of great stuff. He worked on the My Little Ponies and stuff. My gut feeling, and for, if for some reason, William, if you listen to this... You, and you haven't motherfucked Rod for the shit yeah. he's been talking so far. Yep. Right. Please correct me on any of my assumptions. Edwin McCain has. <laughs> yeah. Just did very, the, I just uh, did a pantomime of dropping right, yeah. that name. He was very nice about it, by the way, so you feel free to be nice about it, too. My gut feeling tells me that because he was the... If he was the sole music person for this show... He probably just had to do everything. So right. I don't know if that's him singing. He probably wrote it. If he didn't sing it, maybe he hired a friend just to ghost vocal it or something. I've done that for stuff. I've sang for friends projects uncredited because I didn't want credit. And also for the show like this, it's easier to have what they call like an all in or a work for hire just so they don't have to like clear a bunch of stuff down the road like when it goes to Disney Plus. So there's no credit for it, probably by design so they can easily like migrate the show to wherever they need to. Otherwise, it's kind of like the Dazzler song in 92. Which I'm still I'm still dying because that was like a full fledged song. That was like yeah. half of a verse that we got to hear in it. Then we heard more of it a little bit later, right? Yep. So, so this one, I think, Kit and you mentioned. fucking know the guy who did the music on the show, yeah. which makes it even worse that we don't know it. Yeah. So I was talking to him about the other. There were other people involved in like the music part, maybe not the composition part of stuff. Was put this way, like you know, no surprise because Saban. A lot of the other people weren't exactly the most moral people either. What's craziest, for all we know, it could be somebody famous that sang that Dazzler song or this song. I don't know if you saw the news. You, you know the singer Tanache? Not off the top of my head, no. She's, she's a great R&B artist. She's written for a bunch of artists like Britney Spears and stuff. She's sang with Britney Spears. Anyway, she's pretty popular, but she just like dropped the information in one of these interviews this week that she was one of the little kids on Polar Express and she did the mocap and the voice and stuff. We're like, wait, what? Or it's kind of like, have you watched Shit's Creek? No. Shockingly, so, I haven't. I feel like that's a oh, show I would like. Show. The, the character Patrick on there, who's, I can't think of his name. Eugene Levy's kid? Yeah, Daniel Levy's his character's husband in the show, Patrick. Patrick was Franklin the Turtle. So it's just like you guys never know. Hollywood's weird. So this song, if anybody knows anything about it, because I know we have a lot of industry friends that listen to us. I don't know why, but if you know anything about <laughs> they're the it, only people who listen yeah. to us. <laughs> and if you and if you're Thank not, you. <laughs> and if you're not under like a weird Saban esque NDA, leave us some information in the comments or DM us or whatever, because that'd be super interesting. Because this does sound like a song that was at least partially done. Right. All that said, Nightcrawler <laughs> asked Scott to support him in liking the song. And Scott just is in total, like, crushed puppy, pissed off mood. He's not happy about it. Isn't really paying attention because they almost get rear-ended. And then there's, like, 
cops chasing and Nightcrawler's like, oh, I don't know why they're in such a hurry. And Kitty's like, because there's like 12 cops that are behind them right now. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a really hectic scene. It was kind of confusing. I had to rewind to, to catch because like, there's a helicopter now? Like, what's going on? Yeah. So, you know, at one point they're on a bridge. I believe they're on the 205, which is not anywhere near New York City or Westchester. Just so that's clear. It 205 is in New York but it is not anywhere near the city where these kids would have been. Adjacent to the beach they went to last, a couple episodes ago. Which probably was <laughs> New Jersey, even though Jersey doesn't have like cliff sides in it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the cops get in the way of this car. They they basically put up a roadblock and the car, you know, he almost hits them, but veers off. That's where, you know, Nightcrawler unhooks his, his seatbelt. He's kind of like, F this. And the cars hanging over and there's just a bus underneath it and i don't know why the bus wasn't moving oh well i don't know why it wasn't moving but i know they got like almost hit in that whole kerfuffle with all this stuff so maybe something happened there yeah, yeah. i i don't know the bus drivers in this show are not the best bus drivers it was very it i mean actually this was right about the same time with the spider-man thing very like similar was that spider-man one or was that spider-man two the movie the yeah where he had the choice of the bus the bus was hanging off the thing and then the new yorkers like helped him because the goblin or green goblin if it was I, green goblin it had to be one got the internet in front of me but we don't the, research shit that we uh, talk about here spider-man wait 2002 okay so yeah this is for spider-man i think wait nope this is an ai answer it doesn't it's not telling me the truth. Stop using AI. I don't have a choice because I'm in this thing. And so it just. God damn it, Rod. Peter Parker runs after school. But OK, it doesn't matter. Anyway, it reminds please me of that leave scene. this in the edit. <laughs> yeah, whichever whichever Spider-Man movie it was where he had to save like the bus or, you know, or whatever. like that's it. This reminded me of that. And it happened in New York. And it was it, with, at least within the same like few years with there. what movie it was in. And that's where we get a cliffhanger going into the animated intro. And I realized it as I'm saying it out loud, I didn't watch the animated intro for it being a new season to see if it was any different. I was half paying attention because I was trying to type up my notes from all the, the music stuff. From the buses? Yeah. I didn't... Does your Disney Plus anything. let you pause yet, by the way? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, okay, okay. I think I was just that day. But I didn't notice anything strikingly different. But I was also kind of looking at my peripheral. I can't remember if the it had like, the opening had the the Chamber of Cerebro opening, like the X from that. The, that might have been new, but I'm not remembering. That is lot. that is new because okay. remember we didn't even have a Cerebro chamber until halfway yeah. through the first season. So, well, I fucked up, Rob. I've Me spent too. more time paying attention to the Japanese intros multiple yeah. for X Men '92 than I did for the start of this season. So, <laughs> all right. By next week's recording, when we have our special guest, I will watch the intro so I don't sound like an asshole in front of our guest. So coming out of the intro that I didn't watch, Nightcrawler wants to help. Scott stops him and he's like, no, man, we can't. There's too many cameras around. What was your initial thought on that? Like, it was weird because even the Scott we knew from 92 he was an asshole, but he was still going to save people. He was just going to, like, not be nice about it. it he was just going to let a bunch of people, like, kids die. <laughs> to me, it was the similar reaction I had when watching Man of Steel with the tornado scene with Clark and his dad. Regardless of any of the Snyder stuff, regardless of how you feel about the rest of the movie, that was fundamentally the biggest problem I had with Man of Steel is... I do not believe that Clark would not have saved his father in that instance. Mm, Regardless of what he his dad said, I, re I refuse to believe that he was weak-willed enough to not be like, no, screw it. This is the right thing to do. Yeah. And I feel and I feel like when Scott said that, I was like, you're not going to let people die, dude. Like, at the end of the day, you still have to be a hero, even if you're kind of a petulant brat once in a while. I guess the, the thing that kind of made sense here, though, was they're not heroes yet because they even talk about it in this episode they haven't actually done a whole lot publicly you know they've gone on they haven't missions. done like anything publicly yeah so they've gone on these little like internal missions to try to kind of keep them they, they're they were basically like kind of protecting themselves in a bunch of scenarios and stuff but they haven't like gone off and saved you know other people and stuff a whole lot and so he's not a hero yet but he is like a boy scout so he's one of those guys that if like his superior says like don't out yourself He'll do it to like everything else's detriment. So I guess that's kind of what's happening here. And we'll see later. This moment was, I think, kind of supposed to be a little off-putting. 
Mm -hmm. because it becomes like a focus of the rest of the episode. Yeah, so the car does start to fall, and Kurt is the one who, I guess, makes the first move on it because he teleports, grabs the driver, and then we see that this was also captured on camera. The car is falling, and then from off camera, Scott's, you know, Scott's blast. You know, this kind of goes to what we talked about a little bit with the last season. He's getting more control because if he does that wrong, that could actually kill more people. Right. Yeah, I'm just kind of surprised more people didn't see that. I guess if there is a car that is hanging over the edge of a highway on top of a bus, how many people are looking in the other direction? Yeah, yeah. Like, people saw the flash happen. That's reported on the news later in the episode. But nobody was looking at it because you're still like, oh, the thing fell and we're seeing where it falls and then you turn around and then it's like unless there's a guy holding a giant laser like cable in marvel versus capcom kind of shit yeah. like you know it's true yeah. too because when they cut back to them later on they're not really in the car so he could have been anywhere so could he could like strategically move somewhere with a little right. bit more incognito yeah so after kurt teleports in with the guy i love how it was shot that he teleports with the guy basically grabbed him from behind and just kind of pushes him off and then immediately teleports away rapid fire too so that the guy couldn't like really realize what was going on and out him kind of scenario i i did like that sequence i was like all of that i kind of buy if you could teleport and all that stuff was real like i feel like that was a uh, realistic on those rights the scenario. the implementation fit the rules of the world is that a fair yeah. way to describe yeah. it yeah yeah because like the, the guy like everything's happening so fast he's probably in shock yeah, so, he, I mean, like, he probably was closing his eyes because he thought he was going to die as the... Right. Like, I can't picture being in a car that's falling towards the ground and you're not, like, gritting your teeth and closing your eyes and hoping for the best, yeah. you know? The closest thing I kind of relate to this with was when I worked in live audio. I was unloading a truck one morning at Dover Downs, Delaware, and... I was just going to ask you what Dover Downs was. I had no uh, idea until you uh, said it's Delaware. Like, yeah, it's a <laughs> casino, you know, in, in Dover. And we were doing, like, some trade show there. And so we were unloading a bunch of AV equipment and you've probably seen these really heavy metal stands that like flat screens go on. They were all under the lift gate and they were up and someone wasn't watching, bumped into one of them. I was turned the other direction, like bent over, picking up, getting something strapped in or whatever. Yep. And the thing is like an 80 pound base fell over and just conked me in the head. But since I didn't know, I didn't see it, I didn't know. I was just like picking something up and then I woke up in the bathroom with a bunch of people like standing around me. And right. I remember from that for me, my first reaction was like, I was just pissed. I woke up like, what the fuck? Like, I didn't even know anything hit me in the head or whatever. It was yeah. just like anger. So I'm not saying like this guy was so angry, but I feel like it's something like that went so tr- like crazy. It could be anything. So I, yeah, this was a, a fun sequence of everything kind of yeah worked. Like the kids were where it happened. They probably didn't see anything because the way the bus was and stuff. Yep. And for all anybody knew with like the, the car just fell a weird way, so it didn't hit the bus. And so, uh, it was cool. I, and again, I'll even give the, like, somebody knows something happened because the news did end up catching it. Yeah. But are you going to miss the... Like, I'm thinking from a cameraman's perspective. Like, everybody talks about it on, like, Instagram. Like, people miss the shot and stuff like that. I feel like the one person who's going to get the shot is the trained cameraman yeah. who is going to follow that car regardless of what tragedy could have potentially happened there. He's going to follow whatever that car lands on. Yeah, It's it's not the Instagram fails of, you know, <laughs> the kid falling down the side of the creek and everybody's mad that we didn't see the kid land. Okay. I have an interesting Instagram feed. Kids getting hurt. My favorite part of that account is it's always they were okay, dash the mom. <laughs> That's what, yeah. And then... You see that Scott and Kitty are basically on the side of a building. Kurt teleports back, and then she pulls them like through the wall to get out of the way, right as a news crew arrives and runs past them. So they did the Homer Simpson Bush meme. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Was that before the Bush meme? It was definitely before it became a meme, but I don't know what episode that that clip came from. So I think you got to look it up. To look it up, see Homer. Let's see what AI tells us now. Yeah, Homer Simpson. Bush meme origin. Simpson. Why can't I type? Ninety four. That is so. that old. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Kitty. Kitty Bush memed. All right, and we have our Instagram clip. Yep. Hey. Rod, I think you need to make the video <laughs> of the two of those side by side with each other. 
I just have the bush, and uh, I'm not going to set it up because I'm going to have to make a lot more work for myself later if I have to actually do it. <laughs> I know you aren't. That's why I said it because I want either. I want it to be more work. I want to take pictures of random shit I see online, and I want you to do these fancy edits that I cannot do. It's perfect. Oh, uh, why is this? Oh, I, oh. I got so confused for a second because it put the screenplay is on this article that I'm reading of the Homer Bush meme, and I I had a freaky moment because the screenplay says driveway day rod is playing and and i was like wait what i nope. forgot flanders different rod kids, flanders kids are talking yep. rod yeah i was like okay i was freaking out there for a second I was like why does it know i'm reading this episode so, it's gonna be great all of a sudden there's just gonna be a gif of you on the driveway with homer next to you <laughs> and then rod let's talk first appearances jump back to the institute Do you i'm gonna let mine? you start and then we'll okay. go from there I'm just going to read through these like next like four lines because I just did a okay. consciousness of like what I thought happened. So I will let you do that. I will not comment or correct yeah. until you tell me you are done and then we'll and, go from there. And then only one of them I'm pretty certain about. Everything else is definitely not right because they're not even. Well, no, two of them are probably right. Anyway, I said Wolf Girl plays fetch with Sunspot. I think that's Sunspot and somehow doesn't kill multiple kids Iceman is playing fetch with a really fast kid who looked like Alex at first but he's fast so he's not Alex I don't know who the glow marble girl is maybe boom boom but only because I know that from you but probably not and then it cuts up to Logan and Xavier talking so that I, I didn't know who any of those kids were besides maybe Iceman and then I'm pretty certain about Sunspot because that was a really particular look so wolf girl is Wolfsbane the one who oh. is in New Mutants and played by the actress who does Arya Stark okay so Wolf Girl, Wolf Spain, pretty yeah. close. Yes, Sunspot. You are spot Sweet. on. And we do know that Sunspot is one of the additions to X Men 97 as a member of the team. Is he not like hot when he turns into the Sunspot form? Because he uh, ran into a kid and didn't kill him. I think it's similar to a like a human torch scenario because human torch can like pick up a person and save them when they're falling from a burning bill or from a building and yeah. not kill them and roast them alive. So okay. I believe it's a controlled scenario like that. Okay. For purposes of making it easier because your your point is spot on of uh bumping in to multiple kid, we could just call him Jamie Madrox. Okay, I don't know who that is. That is that is multiple man's real name. Oh, it's multiple men. Okay, I nope. didn't, I didn't know multiple men from back. You then. did. Okay, so he, yeah, so he was. Yeah, I had a trading card when I was a kid. I don't think I actually saw him in anything else. You would have seen him if you if you didn't block out the trauma of X three, the Last Stand. Oh, I didn't block it out, but I just forgot about it. Yeah, that movie. Iceman playing baseball by himself throws it. Was it. By himself. That was my original note. Was he's playing by himself? But then. But then he know. throws it, and that is cannonball who was Sam Guthrie. Because remember, even though there was an early, early version of Cannonball from the New Mutants comic that had darker hair, both Michelle Waffle and I pointed out that like, oh no, Sam is a blonde. This was yeah. Sam as a blonde. Okay, yeah, I remember that because in the episode that Michelle was on, he was a redhead, which yes. was short, spiky hair. Which fucked with us because there had been the earlier version of him <laughs> shown where he was in his X-Force uniform with the short blonde spiky hair. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. Yes, that was Boom Boom. Oh, wow. uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That was Boom Boom, who already has more screen time in this series than she did in <laughs> X Men '92. And then we get a commentary from Wolverine, who's talking about the new recruits. And then we see three others. Oh, I didn't catch those. There is a girl who starts like a fire in her fingers and hands. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, who. I'm not I'm not shocked that you don't know Magma. <laughs> That's a little bit of a deeper cut. One of the things that I spoiled m for myself, I thought the character was Mirage, who is a, a well-known member of the New Mutants, who is actually the Danny Moonstar from the New Mutants movie. It is not her. I was wrong about that. And we'll get to that in a future episode. Okay. And then the blonde guy with the weird haircut is the best way I could describe him. I did not know who he is. I looked up his okay. name just whatever and we'll get to him but he's not a known character and you know nobody in this is actually addressed by name at all so yeah is it i'm actually kind of surprised that they reference this many specific characters because like we had mentioned before they didn't have a larry houston that we know of at least to throw or maybe this maybe this is what's happening now since season two came out and you know the first season I guess was successful enough. They were like putting in because the first season didn't have any intentional cameos. Like, it was right. just like random person. Well, the the way I interpreted it with this is this is not necessarily cameos. I think this is we're laying the groundwork for introductions, uh, and we wanted to show this whole new crew 
at once, even if we're not gonna get into specifics of each of them, we wanna show you it's more than just the core team from the first season. That makes sense. Also, so they don't have to spend a whole other season just doing individual origin <laughs> story yeah. episodes. Wolverine and Xavier are having a little talk and you know they mentioned needing to keep their anonymity. Meanwhile, there's literally a shootout going out between these new right. students in the front of the school. Like people's powers are blasting back and forth during all this. I like how Logan makes the comment that I'm always harping on. We're gonna need more budget for repairs here. <laughs> I mean, there was a <laughs> giant fireball that like goes above the school at that point. Storm arrives, and I noted that she literally predicted the future. Wait, how so? She is like, you have to see this, and she points a remote at what looked like a piece of wall art that is actually a TV in disguise. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like, I don't know if you've seen, there's certain Philips TVs right now that are just like meant to be displays for like digital artwork. Yeah that you could then switch over to TV mode. So 2001, that was progressive as shit. I had never seen that as like even a trope at that point of you had to be fucking rich to have a TV that would be that oh, yeah. for you. Yeah, or just have a flat screen. Yeah, to have a flat screen that you would leave on for hours on end pretending to be artwork. I actually kind of have a little bit of insight into this. So Do after it. college, so like 2005 or six, my first job in the same AV where I almost got a concussion or I probably had a concussion. They didn't take me to the hospital. We worked on stuff that were art installations and we used flat screens. Back then they were plasmas. So we we're actually right. like fucking heavy. You needed two and, people to pick it up. And they burned out fast as shit because the plasma had the limited lifespan. Yeah, they burned out. And also you actually needed a screensaver. Like they weren't just pretty. They were functional. Yeah, because you, you burn would it. burn it in if it didn't move. And if you broke like a, a pixel or two, it was done because it's, it's a gas. And yep. it leaks and so it would ruin the TV. So there were these art galleries that had these installations in it. One of the biggest things the company I worked for did had like a rotating screen so that it would change depending on what artwork was showing on it. If it was like landscape or portrait. And this was something that a lot of like very wealthy people wanted as it's something in their home, but it didn't exist. I wonder if this show had it in here because someone knew some rich fuck who was like <laughs> bitching about not having this. But I know why it wasn't possible that time is because we probably weren't the only ones, but the company I worked for was working on this. And we're like, it is so impossible to have a static image on a plasma screen for an indefinite amount of time and not mess up your screen for lifespan, like you said, for the burn-in. Even if it wasn't a plasma screen, even if it wasn't a flat screen, and I had seen, you know, you, you basically gave the, the impression of it being a flat monitor by basically cutting a giant hole in your wall and having it live in the hole. Yeah. You still couldn't let it just sit on a static image because it would just burn into the screen yeah. permanently. Oh yeah, the CRTs were much worse. Like those would be like a few hours and you'd have like Windows starting screens burnt into your monitors and stuff. But this, I think that the, I think was, was because it was flat. A lot of these like wealthy people were like, well, it's flat. So it's like a painting. And we're like, on sort the outside, of on the inside, there's a lot of shit going on, you know? And so, so yeah, I kind of did predict the future, but I, I, man, this is where it, if we, if we end up like talking to some of the writers and stuff, it'd be great to s to find out if whoever specifically pitched this idea in here was like I was at this dude's house the other day who's being a dick about this painting but this was the time period that this was being worked on because I was working at a company like right after this I love how you say that you know we're gonna forget if we right. if we talk to any of the writers <laughs> of this series we are a hundred percent gonna forget to ever ask this yeah, the yeah. amount of things that we said we should ask the Leewalds when we have them on the show that we just completely forgot to yeah. ever write down and come back to it's it's just a giant void of of our you know word vomit so it was, it was probably better for all of us <laughs> yeah we had a great episode with them we don't want to ruin it with our yeah. bullshit so storm puts the tv on it is the news broadcast that i mentioned and instantly everybody knows that it was scott internal in the you know from the the adults that's what we're going to call them charles wolverine and storm they're just the only adults at this fucking yeah. place right Oh, yeah, and that's another thing Logan mentioned to Xavier, like, we're going to need some more teachers, which is fair. <laughs> yes, teachers and insurance. <laughs> and security, probably. At that point, Scott, Kitty, and Nightcrawler get back, and they kind of realize that, you know, they're busted. They, they got found out, even though they were going to try to keep it on the DL right. and not mention it. Which, again, I think this is probably one of the last eras where that could happen, is, like, from when this show comes out until 2010, 2011, at the most, because... 
by, you know, the early 2010s, everybody had a quality camera in their pocket. So, yeah, for anybody that may be too young to remember this, this was really plausible that they could have gotten away with it this time. Yeah, if there was not a news camera at the scene, they could have actually gotten away with it. So we get that moment that you were kind of referencing earlier, Rod, where Scott and Xavier start having their back and forth. And I don't want to say it's my least favorite version of Xavier, not because it's bad writing or something, but he's just not a likable version of Xavier to me. The only reason I can't say he's my least favorite is there's a few versions in the comic book that are <laughs> supremely fucked up, and this gray zone Xavier is nowhere near as bad as certain comic versions of him. So, And to his credit, because I started off being like, oh, Xavier, where are you going with this? He acknowledges, he's like, I would have done the same thing. I just want you to be more careful. At the same time, I was like, man, this is one of those talks you get from like your authority figures when you're a teenager you're like i don't i don't care you're only talking to me to be talking to me you're not telling me anything new scott did like nothing's gonna change that yeah conversation yeah scott is straight up bothered that he hesitated like not even you know the end result was they still saved but he's even bothered that he almost didn't do it so as much as we make jokes about the show of scott kind of being like an ass at times like he has all the best intentions, but this is also, you know, this is the, the teenager version of him. He's he's scared. He's not a full-fledged leader yet, so I get it. And he points out, at the end of the day, saving everybody else is the most important thing. He also mentions that it feels like, you know, because Xavier says, well, the X-Men need to remain anonymous. He's like, well, it feels like we're hiding in shame. And then Xavier gives mostly what I can relate to, like hearing when people have been in the closet and stuff like that. You know, the others aren't ready to embrace you. And at some point it's like, fuck if they're ready to embrace you or not. You got to put yourself out there. It's a hard conversation because Xavier is in the mindset of, well, if we are out there publicly, there's going to be violence against us, you know? And that's, I mean, that's stuff that the queer community has to deal with even to this fucking day. So it's kind of scary how long the parallels of the show end up lasting. What's the saying? Mm -hmm. History may not always repeat, but it rhymes. Yeah. And then Xavier basically says, you know, the, the best thing to do is to do what you can without revealing what you are. And that was like, that was a gut punch hearing that, man. Because that's yeah. like, I get the perspective from him but it's also like what was he supposed to do just let those kids die nightcrawler saved the fucking criminal but he, scott was gonna sit there and let the kids die he had to take the risk yeah yeah a to your point he did exactly what xavier said is like you know they still don't know who we are and they still don't know they're mutants so no. mission accomplished so we did what you said the other side of that is to me it kind of parallels like once again protestant upbringing i remember a sketch in high school at one of the churches where basically you know this guy came out and so the solution in the sketch and not not judging all christian faiths but this particular subsect mm -hmm. their solution to that guy coming out was like well as long as you get married have kids and just pretend you'll be fine until the day you die you know it's like this is kind of akin to that we're like well, as long as you are never like no one else ever knows, then right. you'll be good. I'm like, Ugh. like that gives you the yeah, you know? that's correct. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I appreciate that Scott kind of got the last word of it. It was like I'm having a hard time with this one. Like, mm -hmm. yes, as you should be having a hard right. time with it. Morally, you should not be okay with not being able to save people when you have the power to do so. Yeah, especially with the team. Like there were three of them there that could like they did they did do something, but they, yeah. They, Imagine the other side of that. The three of them come home from school. And they're like, we let a bus full of kids and a dude die. And they're probably more because that it was probably going to be an explosion or something, you know? They're, yeah, buses explode. I could see that. He's like, is that what you wanted from us? Is like, yeah. is that, was that the right decision? Jumps over and Alex is surfing. And we realize it was him sending a video to Scott. Props again to like, Alex has some high quality camera work. The cameras in this show are 15 years in the future. This, right. Like this was like third generation GoPro quality footage of him surfing. Yeah, because he was surfing, but it's like up close. So it's kind of like Spike's camera where he could zoom in across the city. <laughs> it was it was it was a GoPro on a selfie stick, which yeah. definitely didn't exist until like 2014. And he was zoom calling him. Yes. Like that just wasn't a thing. I remember I wrote it as FaceTime, but yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because we did have I remember around this time I had like a webcam thing, but I don't know how to describe it to anybody who wasn't there. It was like the screen would refresh every 15 seconds. It was, was like a best. slideshow, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So they were, but they were doing, and he even had it in a window. Like yep. that was, you could not be multitasking and doing that. And no, there's no computer that could have handled it, <laughs> especially like a clunky looking desktop. Like what yeah. Scott had, there was no way that tech was 
was able to that thing would have been on fire if yeah. it was trying to handle that or the connection speed yeah that is wild i mean they 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 were the first wi-fi campus let's be real fuck, there you go. fuck your <laughs> school rod yeah. they were the first wi-fi <laughs> campus alex mentions that he's thinking about going pro next year i felt like scott just took like two like back-to-back gut punches because we know from the the season finale of of season one he's very excited to find out that he has this brother his brother didn't want to join the institute but maybe scott was like holding out hope that like oh maybe he just needs to like deal with the fact that he's a mutant for a little bit and then he'll change his mind and alex is like no i i want to just live a regular life i don't want to kind of do the super heroic shit yeah, I guess, and I guess they reinforced that by showing that he has pretty good control of his powers. Because my first reaction was like, well, you just learned you have like a cannon in your hands and stuff. Like, I would want to know how to control that first. But they showed him like, you know, closing the door and they mentioned like the worst thing he's done is like blow up an enchilada. Right. It's like he has control, but he doesn't have full control, mm-hmm. which is an ongoing thing with Havoc in the comics, too. Like, he's never as controlled as his brother is. So mm-hmm. it actually makes a ton of sense. But I guess like, Something happened where they they were like, we need to write him out of the show. First season. I mean, we only got, what, one episode of Havoc in X-Men 92? So maybe yeah. maybe Marvel's just like, yeah, yeah, you could reference that he has a brother, but like, let's not go too into the details yeah, on yeah. it. We jump over to the school, and my first reaction is, oh, look, Paul isn't dead. Oh, is that Paul? I uh, believe it was Paul. Yeah, because he was like, hey, look, it's Gene. Yes, so Paul's not dead. It's a Beatles reference, too. Paul's dead. Sorry, music people will get that. <laughs> oh, is that the, the conspiracy that Paul McCartney has been dead for decades and it was yeah, somebody yeah, yeah. who was replaced? Yeah. As far as we know, Brotherhood kids are standing, like, against the, the wall by the entrances, not on the bleachers like everybody else. Jean arrives, and she's waving, and it's <laughs> as soon as she starts waving, I'm like, there's no way she's looking at Scott. There's absolutely yeah. no way. This is teen movie trope time where scott needs to just have like the worst series of events happen in rapid succession to him yeah yeah, yeah. We're, we're watching scott's not, i guess it's not a villain origin story but asshole origin story. <laughs> at the very least the best friend origin story there you go the friend zone origin story randomly we see nightcrawler throws a paper airplane this is a scene transition not scene transition like a shot transition yeah no one sees toad from a distance being gross and eating flies with his tongue <laughs> they're credit though once again like teenage boy they're like ah they're all yeah. gross yeah, he literally has yellow teeth and a green tongue. It's this. It's kind of this show's version of nobody looks up and sees the Sentinels. Yeah. This is just nobody actually looks at Toad's face. And they kept up the theme of his backdrop music is like this like stock 90s like hip hop. And I like his comment too. Like he can't catch the fly all of a sudden. He he never had a problem before, but he was like, hey, even the flies think they're better than us. And I was like, wait, what? Are you? I guess it's just supposed to further them as the outcast. Well, at the end of the last season, we did have that comment oh well what does this mean now for us and now i guess it's like yeah they don't have anything they literally just have each other as a group and that's it which for pietro that's got to be extra awkward because he doesn't have his dad anymore and then we we see that lance is still into kitty which i know we got that in like their first interaction in in their origin episode but like i kind of forgot about that plot line for a second I had totally forgotten about it. Yeah. Then there is a great shot, and this is where there are aspects of this animation that are way more cinematic than 92 was. That gets cut off by Rogue walking into the forefront of the scene and sits next to a girl with purple hair. Yeah, Thoughts so, on the girl with purple hair? It's a new British girl asked Rogue for directions to class. Maybe I'm reading too much into this. I feel felt like there was a little spark there but I, also they just never same back, so absolutely know. same like i thought there was like are we queer coding these two right now yeah. not in a bad way oh shit this is it this progressive right now it presented it in like realistic i guess kind of ways maybe the best way to put it it wasn't like love at first sight the music slowed down her hair was slow they were just like oh like yeah we vibe right away because of the fact that she said she was from Manchester, England, and her name was Risty Wild. Did not recognize that name. Inadvertently spoiled something for myself. Not going <laughs> to say anything else. The only thing I can confirm for you, it is not Psylocke. I was like, oh, is this like a punk rock version of Psylocke because of purple hair from England? It is not Betsy Braddock. It is a completely different character. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so they're, she's like, kind of like the cameos at the beginning. She, they're just like sliding something in for us for later. Right. The thing that only I would pick up on and <laughs> nobody else would, she has geometry 
with Mr. Barton. Oh, Clint Barton. Was that is that supposed to be? It is or? absolutely not. But I okay. picked up on <laughs> Barton because I'm the lone Hawkeye fan. Yeah. That would be great though if there was a surprise that like Hawkeye is the geometry teacher in the school. I mean, you need to know geometry when he starts doing trick shots, right? That kind of tracks. And then you'll be. There's that. no way that's legitimate, but I yeah. wanted it to be. <laughs> and yeah, once again, with no basis whatsoever, it'd be even better if the reason he's there is because, like, Kate Bishop is in high school or something. You know, like, they have this whole headcanon now. You mean Kate Bishop, who was literally not invented at the time of yes. this? Yes, that's why exactly. <laughs> yeah. Lance goes over, makes a move, and gets rejected by Kitty. Rightfully so. <laughs> also, found out. The character that Kitty is talking to is a character that we're going to see more of. Oh, okay. Wow. And I'm not saying anything else. I'm sad those things got spoiled for me, but I could say them to you without spoiling the important moments of them. So I'll let you know if TikTok commenters do that instead. (laughs) (laughs) It's literally just a list of all the heroes and villains that appear in the show in the TikTok comments. And then we meet Edward Kelly as the new principal. I was assuming he was like the Senator Kelly replacement. So the Senator in every iteration I have ever seen and could find online is always Robert Kelly. So I don't know if that is a connection or it's just a a coincidence. Because I know that they've changed other names in this show. So like I feared it wasn't far-fetched. Right. But with the ones that they changed where it was like Toad and Avalanche, they were dramatic changes. They weren't even close to each other. Like Toad's original name was mortimer or something along those lines yeah i just figured this would make sense though because you know if they're going to keep with like this high school drama kind of thing it makes more sense for like senator kelly to be a school official right as a direct threat as opposed to like some you know off in dc you know politician exactly and then as a way to mess with the principal and impress kitty i was gonna say he's flirting with kitty (laughs) lance makes a mini earthquake and here's the thing we live in california we literally a few episodes ago made jokes about the hurricane because it was such a light earthquake in Los Angeles. That light and earthquake in New York, everyone would be losing their goddamn minds. That is not the environment where they are used to the ground shaking a little bit. Yeah, and no, everybody I'm... was pretty okay with it. Yeah, to the point where they just moved on with the assembly, which I, they would have evacuated the kids by that point. Oh, 100%. If you get that little of an earthquake, that whole building would have been cleared in New York. I was actually kind of surprised it kind of worked. Yeah, where she like kind of gives the shrug of like, ew, but then also gives a smirk and then laughs. Mm -hmm. And Lance takes this as a, oh, let's make a bigger earthquake. Lance is not smart. Let's do it 2000%. (laughs) Yeah, let's go from a 3.5 to a 6.7 on the Richter scale. (laughs) And he does so, continues to do it. And that's when at least people started freaking out a little bit and the scoreboard falls and we get a cut to commercial break. And I think, to me, I felt like more people were scared that the scoreboard was falling down than the actual earthquake. I could see either way on it, absolutely. Regardless, I feel like people were not scared enough. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, they didn't leave. No. You come back from commercial, and Gene is able to psychically move it, which I guess is the only power that is free of detection. Like, people wouldn't... Unless somebody's staring at Gene and seeing, like, her, like, deeply concentrate, you wouldn't think to look at her and know that she's using her power. And then they... Everybody just kind of brushes it off. That was the part that kind of messed with me, because, like, someone who doesn't live in the East Coast wrote this part because yeah like i i when i lived in delaware we had like an earthquake about that magnitude you know where like it shook things off the shelves and stuff but didn't do any structural damage that we were shut down for a day nobody knew what to do everybody's like nope this these are the end times and yeah in la we're like the scene from independence day where it's just like this isn't even worth getting out of bed (laughs) Yeah, I don't even feel them. Dude, like, the, I, just, I, the, I, I think I told you the hurricane day where that was like, I went to Twitter to check to see if there was actually an earthquake. I only knew because you guys were posting about it. I actually, uh-huh. actually, it was your Instagram story was the first one I saw. Oh, the hurricane. Yeah, for hurricane. <laughs> I barely felt it. I thought it was maybe just like traffic or something. And then a split second later, a bunch of us in my area, at least we got an iPhone alert yes. about it. And I was like, a lot of good that does this. Yeah, hey, aren't they supposed been- to go off before the hurricane or the... Yeah, 
yeah, the hurricane earthquake. <laughs> earthquake hits. I did hear someone say like the reason they do that though is to brace for a potential aftershock. So I can kind of see that. Yeah, like, I can see that. So the principal brushes off almost being killed by an earthquake. Everybody calms down very quickly. Nobody is evacuated. I do not have any faith in this principal's skill to protect right. these children. And he starts making some jokes. He talks about how it is a new semester, like I referenced earlier. Talks about meeting you new challenges. Okay, that sounds still in line with what a principal would say. And then we obviously get there is something else going on with this guy. Luckily, I did not spoil anything for myself or him. I literally did not look up anything beyond the name. But talks about unique talents, special gifts, and abilities. Yeah, my note was Principal Kelly gives a really on-the-nose speech about being special. So, given that neither of us have had this spoiled for us, do you have any predictions who he is? And, we have, and we're not going to verify it. We're going to see if we're right yeah. when it, whenever whatever happens. I'm going to stick with my earlier prediction. I think he's just going to be like this show Senator Kelly or President Kelly. He's just going to misunderstand mutants and then do too much you know, <laughs> like to, to regulate it. I am going to go to the extreme on this one. I think it is a possibility he is either Apocalypse or Sinister. Ooh, okay. I could definitely see Apocalypse. Sinister, man, they would have to change a lot with his name and stuff. But Apocalypse, we've seen him be a lot of people in history. So Yeah. So Actually, yeah, that would fit too with Mystique, right? It's like, ah, oh, she failed because I got to do it myself. Well, in, in this iteration, Mystique was working for Magneto, not yeah, yeah. Apocalypse. But yes, to your point, though, like, yeah, just every, every principle is a fucking shapeshifter. Right. <laughs> and then he says he needs everybody to show their support by coming to the championship soccer game and arrive there early, basically for the pep rally before it. Bet that's on par with high school stuff. Which I do not feel like that many kids would have wholeheartedly supported a brand new principal who didn't really do anything yet. Like he was, he wasn't like the loved principal because he had done something cool. He was just like, he didn't die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was all he did. He just didn't die. Like, oh, he, he shook that off casually. No. He must be cool. He's cool youth pastor. Cut to outside. Sad Scott is waiting to leave. We see that Lance is not taking no for an answer with Kitty. Yeah, that was a little creepy, too. Scott sees it. Did you notice he does the arm grab, which we've seen, like, that's, like, the closest thing to, like, you know, male on female violence that we've seen in the show. And Kitty actually just phases her hand right through his grasp. Yeah, that was a good power to have in that situation. Yeah. And then you start getting a little more of what we saw in the survival camp episode of Lance and, and Scott just being antagonistic to each other. And Scott's like ready to blast. And Lance is all for it because Lance knows he can take it. All it does is out Scott. Like a little bit right before this scene happened, I was like, what is keeping the Brotherhood from? Like if, if Xavier is so worried about the public knowing about mutants, what is keeping the brotherhood from just doing it because they don't care i mean they are literally rebellious teens like they they are yeah. the definition of we don't give a shit but kitty talks him down and then as if you were nostradamus rod lance says it's time for the brotherhood to go yeah. public so they, they probably that's probably less me being smart and predictive and more the writers doing a good job of like setting up the expectation <laughs> planted all those proper seeds for you to be yeah. like yes i agree with you guys here yeah, yeah. jumps over to the soccer game. And then we see Jean's friend Taryn from the first season is still around. Oh, okay. She was yeah. the one in the Blob episode that I specifically yeah. remembered her name was Taryn. Yeah, because I thought it was Karen. <laughs> yes, you did think she was Karen. But she gets announced. Xavier arrives and just in time to see Jean get announced. The principal gets on a microphone and he shows the school's mascot, which is the Bayville Hawk. And it was on fire. And that is not a thinly veiled reference, I feel like. <laughs> For that to be the thing that happens right after Gene oh. gets announced. Oh, oh, oh like a few. And apparently yeah, it was thinly veiled yeah. enough. I didn't think about that, yeah. I was like, well, okay, so now we know what's going to fall here in a few minutes. <laughs> not wrong about that, but yeah. yeah. I don't know of any high school that would have an on fire monument on the premises, you know? <laughs> right. And also, usually your mascot is like a person in a costume. So I thought it was going to be like Toad was going to show up in the costume and fuck around or Lance was going to be in it or something like that. I was not expecting it to just be a giant golden <laughs> bird that's just shooting flames out the top. It can't be safe. 
safe. Like even no, even regardless of the non mutant world, that can't be safe. Although you know, I like the idea of Toad being the the guy in the mascot suit. That tracks. I I knew a bunch of mascot dudes back in Delaware because my band at the time we did the Philadelphia Phillies theme song, so we got to know that whole company that do those mascots. And Toad fits that personality type you need to have to be in that suit. <laughs> I feel like he would be a very good NBA mascot because he would be able to do some really sick dunks with like his oh, yeah. weird jumping abilities and stuff. Yeah, but it's also just more of like having movement that's so exaggerated that when it's muted by having a big padded suit, it's still like it's carries. still big. Yeah. yeah. Game kicks off. And right as that's happening, Toad uses his tongue from the roof of the announcer's box. Is that what it's called? Let's go with announcer's box. Yeah, we don't yeah. watch any sports between right. the two of us. It's so sad. Uses his tongue, which I feel like that's the most control we've ever seen from Toad's tongue. Like usually it's like the quick oh, snap, true. but this is like... Like, he straight up, like, goes around and under a corner and stuff like that to grab the microphone. Yeah, that was a good, like, 20, 30 f- oh, of, of stretch on the tongue there. Uh, it's a, <laughs> that's a lot of tongue. It's shocking he's not more popular. Right, with everyone. Yeah. So you see Lance pops up on the microphone on top of the announcer stand. Quicksilver is near the lights, which they had, like, you know, the giant spotlights. Mm-hmm pushes them towards Lance. Blob is just there. (laughs) And they're all like in their full fledged suits too. Like there's nothing subtle about it. I do love that Blob's suit is just kind of like a biker version of Blob. It's not an actual uniform. It's just like him not in his overalls kind of thing. Yeah. And I didn't know this. Is his real name Quab? Leave the awkward pause in to let you guys know that I just gave a what? Look, I say this because, okay, so now I'm guessing that this was a closed caption. Yes. Like goof. His real name is Fred. Okay, that's what I thought. I thought it was yeah. something more like normal. Yeah, his uh, he's Fred Dukes, I believe, is Blob's full name. So Lance, when he gives everybody's introductions in the closed captions, says this is Quab, Q-U-A-B. So anyway, doesn't I know that that's a caption thing. I think Quap is the name of a computer game that you could play on like Flash. We get the big speech, which feels pretty momentous for the episode where Lance declares, yeah, we are all mutants. Yeah, I actually, so the only thing that would have been more believable is if before he was able to give that speech, if he showed up with a spotlight on him in that outfit, he would have got made fun of and booed first. <laughs> Especially in 2000, like one, because in high school. I think we've referenced this in in previous episodes but like this was still harry potter was just coming out and making nerddom acceptable you know you had like lord of the rings and matrix but like you know going to comic book conventions and people being in cosplay was not pop culture accepted and then these weren't even be based off of a character this was just like yeah. oh there's a fucking weird kid they probably like at the clo- the only thing you had like an equivalent would have been Star Wars and Star Trek conventions where mm-hmm. people would put together like space outfits and stuff like that at the time in 2001. Yeah. And he's also in like not a very good costume. Yeah. I think we've talked about that. Like he he is the one redesigned costume that not that his original costume was great, but I just don't love this this avalanche outfit. So, but, so yeah, what a way to this, like start the season off strong is it like outing all the mutants because then he just goes and like points across the field and he's like and so are these kids yeah he's talking about like you know we're different we're what you probably call freaks and that's like there's a little bit pointed as he says freaks like we've talked about like how kitty has kind of thrown that around and and stuff also at that point the announcer is crawling up the ladder and toad just kind of like flicks him off of it so that guy's dead and lance is like yeah there are lots of mutants scott gene and all their friends at the xavier institute just literally outs every single one of them i thought that he was gonna throw gene under the bus as far as like that's why she's so good at soccer or something you know but they just kind of glossed over that you know maybe she's actually just legitimately good at soccer and he has that moral ground of like i have enough ammo that i don't even need to lie yeah no. Yeah, we'll, we'll give him that much credit. But then he tries to kill the entire soccer team. You know, he he makes the, the quake happen. It actually goes in full-fledged, like, opens a fault line in the ground. Jean saves her friend's life, who very easily crawls out of it. Quicksilver does the tornado spin around the principal, which is like, now I think every person who does Quicksilver in cartoons is going to use that because it's just such a fun thing to make yeah. a tornado and just have somebody probably throwing up uncontrollably stuck in the middle of that thing. 
I was gonna say this. He probably realistically would have passed out, right? In going that fast and spinning around. I don't know if anybody in the who's still <laughs> listening has been in a tornado and survived it. Please, please let us know. But that opening when Avalanche opens up the soccer field, that was like uh, it hasn't happened yet. But at this time, but that was like the opening for that movie. This is the end. I have not soccer. watched it, but I saw that in the trailers. Okay, yeah. So yes. it's like this is literally the very first thing that happens, and not even really a spoiler. Rihanna falls in. You know, mm. like it, it's this. It's like a wild scene. It totally reminded me of that. So then Scott looks back at Xavier and he literally grabs a duffel bag. I mean, I looks- carry my my superhero <laughs> suit in my duffel bag with me all right. the time. And it looks Xavier dead in the eyes. He's like, well, cat's out of the bag. And then they go off to change. <laughs> Which I kind of, I love that they took the time to change, even though they just got outed by Lance on a microphone by name. The only thing, and this is still a stretch, that I'll I'll give them a little credit for. Plausible like, deniability. Plausible, but also maybe there's something special about their outfits that allow them to like fight a little bit better. Nope. I know that's a stretch, but... Or maybe at least with Cyclops, his visor is a little bit better than just sunglasses or something. But yeah, but thing, I feel like he could have just pulled out his visor and kept yeah. his regular clothes on. Yeah, there's a lot of everybody else that like, does Kitty really need a special outfit? You know, whatever. But, sure. <laughs> of all people, Kitty doesn't need a special yeah. <laughs> outfit. So Xavier's like, oh shit and then he telepathically hits up storm being like yeah i need to get you over here now and i think he just didn't call wolverine because i don't think he wanted wolverine to murder these children because that's what would have happened this this like literally just outs mutants to the entire world wolverine's just gonna start popping claws yeah yeah so we see blob actually start to make his way up the bleachers as that's happening did you notice that the bleachers were starting to cave under blob's weight too Oh, yeah, yeah. It's and so I wonder if there's, like, a little bit about that that was, like, density control. Because we've never seen Blob, like, aside from the one table in the cafeteria, just, like, damage stuff by walking up it or past it, you know? Oh, that's true, yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, let's do, that. let's do that instead of, like, in continuity. Blob grabs the flaming bird, and then from off camera, Cyclops shoots it, and, of course, the school lights on fire. Because of a giant flame yep. they put over the bleachers middle of the field you get scott and lance who kind of like square up to each other and then they don't even start using powers they're literally like ready to like get into a fist fight at that point yeah like i think scott was kind of relieved he's like yeah i could actually go now it it was personal with them so like it's just more satisfying to have like the fist hit your face yeah then we kind of get like a great series of individual moments where spike takes out some of the cameras and stuff kitty The satellite dish, sorry, you're right, yep. Kitty pops up there, puts her hand through the camera, and actually pulls out the VHS and then destroys the VHS tape inside. I wonder if that makes sense to kids who were born in, like, the last 10 years. Like, what should you do? It's it's like, have you seen the meme where it's a music cassette with the pencil next to each other? And it's like, if she doesn't get this, she's too young for you. I actually... Just today, I'm, I'm ordering samples for some merch for my music stuff, where it's a hoodie that has like my cassette logo on it, and then mm-hmm. underneath it says, "Hey, I'm a single." That was the right kind of people. Too. I can't, I can't even talk shit because I did a pun at the start of the episode, yeah, and all right. so now we're even. You <laughs> yeah, do right. another one, I'm going to talk shit. Gene telepathically stops Quicksilver, saves the principal, and then the principal like goes mutant bigot on her. Like he like shrugs her off as she tries to check on him and help him. My only thing about that is he, he might have been kind of like the guy who got saved by the car earlier in such like confusion disoriented thought, and stuff i might have thought she was the one doing it or something because if he's we're seeing quicksilver because of animation yeah that's a that's that's very very valid that it would have just been like oh he just heard her name and sees her when he gets brought back down that's kind of why I, I i'm i'm still seeing the senator kelly thing kind of play out here you know where like he just, he feels the threat is greater than any positives that could come out of, you know, having no. this crazy situation. Rogue has the line of the episode <laughs> yeah. where she says, I'm about to get big and stupid. So she goes over, absorbs Blob, and then, you know, they just, as, as he's attacking the bleachers and drops him pretty, pretty quickly. Nightcrawler just drops Toad very easily. It was nowhere near as good a showing as it was for Toad in the first episode where him and Nightcrawler were able to kind of go like head to head with each other on this one. He is very much the punchline of a lot of these fights right now. Toad is not holding his own anymore. We see that Lance starts to quake, Scott shoots him, and then Storm arrives and puts out the school. And then I don't know if you saw in the, the background, Kitty is with Lance 
it looks like she's helping him up, not because she's like, you know, friendly with him, but like he's definitely down. Did you did you see that? Oh, I didn't catch that. So one of the things that was noted as being removed is there is a rogue under the bleachers scene and then a Lance and Kitty rescue scene, which looking at the start of the episode, I did notice because normally the episodes are roughly 22 minutes. This one on Disney Plus shows as 21 minutes. And that stood out to me coming from a, a background with TV and knowing TV timing and such. So that must have been part of the, the scenes that were removed that maybe it was like, you know, 15, 20 seconds in total that just brought it from a 22 minute show down to the 21 minute show. Yeah, someone made a decision that like there was a level of crisis that was too much for light of recent events. Well, especially like, you know, things collapsing on top yeah. of another person. It, it totally makes sense. That's when we get a really interesting play out between Xavier and Storm, where he's like, no, I can make people forget. And Storm protests on it, but for the different reason than I thought she was going to. That was exactly my note was, so Storm says, no amount of rain is going to make these people forget. Storm protests, but not for the right reason. <laughs> yeah, it's literally because there are too many of them and he's never been able to do it at that scale. And I was like, God damn, she drank the Kool-Aid on him. So she's been around for him doing this very frequently. Yeah, like she has no problem with him doing it. I think yeah. she's mostly just worried that he's going to strain himself and like pop a blood vessel in his brain or something. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's another thing. She's been around him doing it enough. She knows like what levels of toll this takes on him. Which also parallels the beginning of the first season because she's in the car with him That's right. when he does it to the cop and makes everybody think that it was a gas explosion. Yeah, also on the other football field, or maybe it was the same football field set up different. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah very clean parallels. He still does it, and they keep, for as much as Fast and the Furious says family, this show says choice. And he's like, Yep, still got to do it. I got no choice. And you see a cool animation effect of everybody being affected. But when he gets to the principal, and this is why I think it's Apocalypse as, as my number one, is you're given the impression that it is like a psychic backlash as opposed to that's when he finally ran out of strength. I was on the fence about that. I think that they intentionally made it like, is it because he ran out of juice? Or yeah, was there some... Because it was animated that like something pushed back because I right. had here like kelly pushes back but then like he later on xavier's like oh, it was just too much it's like was it just too much or right xavier wakes up in the hospital and they're like yep everybody believes that it was just the fireworks that caused the damage and <laughs> it's like they, you had fireworks at a high school football game yeah or a high everyone's like game? what kind of irresponsible <laughs> principal are you right now <laughs> you had a fire mascot and then fireworks yeah. so obviously xavier was worried about the footage between you know wolverine and storm and cyclops it's like yeah apparently there was like some sort of magnetic interference that stopped the feed before it was live which let's also be real Nobody was going to be watching a live broadcast of a high school championship soccer game. Yeah. No. I was say, well, I guess maybe because it was a rich school, but I was like, they, they weren't doing like live broadcasts of small events like that at that time. But I guess if you have like rich fucks who want, like, you know, like <laughs> that's the second time things. you've referred to pe rich people as rich fucks in this episode. Well, it's just, it's just you know, the, the type of person that's so disconnected, you know, that doesn't know what a gallon of milk costs or whatever. Like the kind of person that wants a piece of art to also be a display screen. Is also like in two thousand one. We're gonna live broadcast this on like television because so many people are interested. And then Xavier's like magnetic, huh? I wonder if it means he's still alive. And Wolverine is just straight up like, yeah, probably. He can't kill him yet. They still have a few more seasons to go. He's like, my skeleton has not been ripped out of my body yet. Like he's gotta yeah. still be alive. We get like a little bit of a moment between Xavier and Scott, and Scott apologizes. And I hated that he apologized. I legitimately hated that he was like, okay with like, oh no, you were right. The world's not ready for this. And I'm like, shit, dude, really? Yeah, because we didn't get any evidence that anybody had a problem with it. They didn't show. Oh no, I'm sure there absolutely would have been backlash as soon as like, you know, the ground is opening up and people are running yeah. in terror. No, I, I understand that. They just didn't show any of it. Yeah. So like, we don't know what kind of they weren't ready for it scott's talking about we saw like what happened but a, as far as the, the people you know i wonder if he's viewing it from the pandora's box perspective of if we're out in the public as mutants then are is it is it like i guess it's the the batman theory 
where Batman existing creates more villains in Gotham. Yeah. So is Scott thinking like us being out as mutants publicly, does that mean more mutants surface and not all mutants are going to be as good as we are? Could yeah. be the, the, the thought process on it. The episode ends on like, we don't get a ton of these in this show compared to X-Men 92, but it ends on a dark moment where it's Kelly in his principal's office and kind of mentioning like, yeah, you know, Mystique didn't, Finish the job. To your point, probably somebody else that's another bigger character or something. So. Yeah, because I because I was almost originally like, they wouldn't have just put Mystique back as just a different principle, right? That would have been like too obvious. And then that line is like the confirmation of like, okay, well, at least it's not Mystique. So. Yeah, or some, I hope it's not Magneto. That'd be such a dumb move. He got face off, you know. And <laughs> I think if it was Magneto, Xavier would have been able to sense it. To yeah. not just sense it, but to be able to switch his mind because we know Magneto is only able to stop it. I don't think it's been confirmed in this show, but because of the helmet. So Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know what would be interesting if he was a time traveler? We haven't had one of those yet in the show. No, we have not. Well, we we had somebody who jumped forward in time yeah 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 i mean like if there was like a not cable or bishop but i don't know somebody else that was from a future timeline that was trying to terminate or this or whatever and then the only thing aside from the delay and the edits apparently there was another scene where gene destroyed kitty's cell phone i don't have full context for why that happened or where that happened from the wiki that i found but that was one of the three scenes that was removed from the edit so interesting choice yeah i guess since we don't know the context we don't know why the decision was made in relation to you know what had happened a couple weeks before right and it's it's not like there was you know there wasn't a scene where she was holding it that it was like oh okay it was in scene one and then we see her again in scene three and it's not there mm. just yeah don't know why who knows, maybe it was something she was saying on the call may have related to what yeah. was going on in the world or something like that unknowingly. But yeah, Rod, thoughts at the start of season two? I liked it. I I, I liked the, the clean like parallel to the start of the first season. And this was action packed, had enough suspense. You know, there's at least a couple scenarios and characters that we don't know about. But they gave us enough information to be curious about. So, you know, obviously we had like Magneto, all the characters that we got introduced to that were like, is rogue in a relationship is you know like gene is not interested in scott at all at this point so that's no she is just straight up breaking that boy's heart right now and now there's this constant threat of the brotherhood like outing all mutants and so what are they going to do about that right and what's to stop them from just doing it in a spot that xavier is not there like yeah. okay we we messed up because we we thought too small like yeah. i feel like lance has shown he believes in a war of escalation the earthquakes are the perfect example it's small earthquake hmm that's good bigger earthquake and then he literally jumps to biggest earthquake that creates a fault in the middle of the soccer field so yeah yeah huh. and what about you i am excited to see the roster expand. As a reader, one of the things I do love about, you know, the X-Men universe is how many characters and teams and stuff like that there is. Cause you know, you look at Spider-Man, Spider-Man is a pretty small group that is his core in the story. It's Peter, it's MJ or Gwen, it's Aunt May, and then maybe like Harry or, you know, his roommate and stuff like that. But it's not a massive group here. It's like, oh, no, we could get some really cool combinations. And I mean, you could also get infighting within their own team, too. Like, because, yeah. you know, these are the, the seasoned veterans who are still just teenagers. And it's like, oh, who are these new punk kids who are trying to, like, be the hot shit now? I'm actually kind of curious, too, and who the new teachers are going to be. Because it's obvious to have all the students be the new blood and stuff, but I wonder who they're going to make adults and teach at the Institute. That's going to be kind of interesting to see, too. Right, because we don't have the movie equivalent or the even X-Men 92 equivalent of the first class. The first class is Gene, Scott, Kurt, Rogue, Spike, yeah, and Kitty. Like they are, yeah. they are literally the first class. So yeah, so this is gonna be interesting. I'm I'm excited. I like I like this show. 
watch 97 drop in the middle of all this. Oh, it's 100% <laughs> going to happen. We are not going to get to the end of season two without 97 jumping in in the middle of it. I guarantee but, you. But here's open because I want to find out how this plays out. Thank you for joining us. And now, as I've teased it throughout the entire episode, next week for Bada Bing Bada Boom, which is a Boom Boom centric episode. So obviously, I'm a fan of it. We are going to be getting X Men Evolution director Stephen Gordon as our guest on it. So excited to have Stephen on. He has been awesome when I've gotten to meet him at cons. He had that really great lenticular print of the dance between Rogue and Kitty that was at his booth at Comic Cons and stuff like that. So pumped to get Stephen on. He's been great and he's really fun to interact with on facebook fan pages of all things actually oh nice yeah That'll be fun. if you have any thoughts make sure to drop them into the comments to either the youtube upload or the official instagram post about this episode if you go on our tiktok you're only going to be getting responses <laughs> from rod if you like what you heard we appreciate a rating on the podcast app of your choosing you can find us on apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, amazon music spotify google Podcasts, and cast box is that sure. still a thing till somebody says cast box isn't a thing we're the last thing posting on there